So I uh, wanted to welcome everybody to this uh, special webinar from the National Association of Geoscience Teachers. Um, NAGT sponsors a, a vast amount of, of projects and programs for geoscience education broadly. And we are very happy to be able to uh, bring you this webinar today. Uh, we have a extensive series of webinars that uh, you can find on the NAGT website. Um, you can join and become a member of NAGT there as well. Um, you can find all sorts of ways to get involved in the kinds of things that we do. And we are hoping that uh, you not only find this valuable, but that there are other things available through NAGT that you will find equally valuable. So uh, today's webinar is uh, suddenly teaching geoscience online. Um, and the components of that are going to be um, presentations by five uh, really accomplished geoscience educators who have been doing this in many cases for multiple decades, um, probably before we even thought teaching online was possible. Um, and they are going to share with you things that they've learned over the years, and uh, we hope that you will be able to get some real good value out of this. Um, we are also, we will have time after that to do um, I will show you some things on the NAGT website and the Teach the Earth website that are available to help you do this transition. And we will also be having uh, questions and answers after the, uh, after the presentation. Beth, did you want to jump in here? Yes. Um, so my name is Beth Pretzitola and I am on the NAGT webinar committee. Um, and so we put this together, uh, this webinar together, trying to pull from community members who have a, a lot more experience with the online teaching, of course, um, than, than most of the geoscience community. So um, like John said, we'll be starting with short five pre five minute presentations from the five panelists who have each worked extensively in online teaching. Um, John will go ahead and overview online resources and sort of abilities to join the community and be part of it moving together. And then we'll turn to questions and answers. Next slide, please. So the way the panel decided to structure um, thinking about online teaching was trying to break it into four different main components. So um, planning and strategy, materials presentation, student engagement, and assessment. And so each of the panelists is going to give an example of their own online teaching and address about two of the above elements. So you'll, you know, see these uh, addressed multiple times through the through the course of the webinar. So I think we're ready to start with our first panelist, um, Andy Babiarchik. Take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you're safe and sound and full of coffee and tired of listening to the neighbors cut grass as I am. Um, I teach this semester, I'm teaching two courses. One of them is intro geology, I, and that's a 100% online course. I taught that for about 15 years online and about 20 years before that face-to-face. -face. And I'm also teaching an applied geophysics course that is, uh, has not been online that I'm having to move online. So I have sort of one foot in each, uh, each room in this, in this deal. Uh, when you're faced with moving a course online, suddenly, you have to think about what strategies you're going to use. And if you're moving a course you've been teaching face-to-face -face online, what sort of modifications might you need? Next slide. So just briefly, at least to me, I can think of uh, three sort of paradigms for devising a course uh, to be online. The first is what I call talking heads. Um, this is where you more or less take a lecture that you would present face-to-face -face and maybe have pre presented face-to-face -face, and you record that and then you weave that together with a lot of supporting materials into an online version. Uh, what I have done and what I'll be talking about is more of a verbal emphasis, which is uh, very text-oriented, very reading, very response-oriented oriented version of my inter introductory geology course. And um, this is because I wanted this course to be sc scaled to teach to 50 or 200 students. And uh, this is just what seemed to work best for me. So that consists of 
a lot of uh, directed reading from a textbook, you know, that expensive textbook that we have our students buy. Let's make good use of it. Then my own lectures that are uh, presented for the most part in written form and uh, lots and lots of formative assessments throughout the semester. Uh, so the, <clears throat> that's going to be the focus of the rest of my presentation. And then third, you might think in terms of hybrid, where you're going to combine some elements of what you would do in a traditional face-to-face -face course, but integrate that into the online environment. So in my applied geophysics course, I already have my lectures in PowerPoint, but what I'm doing is adding narration and other elements to those presentations for the online environment. Next slide. So I want to give you a little bit of an overview of this uh, verbally oriented introduction to geology that I, I do this course by the way, is Quality Matters certified, if you know uh, about that program. It's a pretty intensive uh, way of working, uh, working a way through putting a course online with, with uh, best practices. And uh, I, if that's accessible to you at your institution, I very highly recommend it. So what you're looking at here is the homepage of my Intro Geology course. And I just want to point out some of the elements uh, of this, not certainly not all of it. Uh, one of the first things you do is make sure that your students know how to navigate through your course. I have multiple pages and groups of pages in this course, and it's very easy for them to get lost. So I have a, uh, a set of navigation tools. This is in addition to what Canvas, which is our LMS, what it uses. I have a set of navigation tools at the top and bottom of just about every page in my course. And uh, this is really just a table with links uh, built into it that uh, let the students move about uh, as they need to. Uh, and then I like to put a piece of eye candy on the, on the home page. Uh, one of the things as you develop an online course you'll have to think about is uh, do you have the rights to use an image? And so I like to use older vintage ephemera like this postcard. This is the Black Hills. I don't remember if this was a USGS postcard or where I got this from, but it's in the public domain. Um, then the first thing that you want to make sure the students have access to is your course syllabus. My course syllabus is about 15 pages long. And, uh, and so I put a link there. Canvas has the ability to display that text when you click on that icon you see with the magnifying glass right in line with the rest of the text. This is sort of your contract uh, between you as a course instructor and developer and your students. And so it's very important that students know it's there and that they see that as soon as they hit the course. <clears throat> so there's that link. Uh, Canvas also has in its navigation menu, which is not shown here, but um, the to the left there is a navigation menu, and uh, that also has a link to the syllabus. Um, so just to just for the benefit of saving a little bit of time, I won't go over all the elements that are here, but. Uh, you want to make sure that whatever you're putting into your course, the students see the most important information first. Next slide. Uh, let the students know exactly what they're expected to do and when they have to do it. And I, uh, I do this multiple times, but on the home page, we're looking at the middle part of the home page here. Uh, I have an extensive assignment schedule showing what the assignments are, when they become available, when they're due, and then any additional notes about those assignments. Canvas uh, has a calendar and in the syllabus page where the due dates are always assigned, uh, but uh, Canvas does not show when assignments open. So I found uh, creating a table uh, for reference for the students is a really valuable thing and they seem to appreciate it. Next slide. Uh, just show you the home page for one of the topical groups that I use in this course. Uh, remember, this is introductory geology. And uh, the first group of topics is Earth and its interior. You want to start 
um, the page, in this case, by explaining to the students why they're looking at this information, what they're going to do, and what it's about. And if you look at group learning objectives, you'll see the first words are identify, classify, and utilize. None of those say learn about. These are, it's, it's important to use the right terms when you're introducing the objectives of at least this part of your course. Hey, Andy, I just wanted to say, can you try to wrap in the next 30 seconds? Okay. So that's just the sort of the splash page for one of the topical uh, parts of the course. Next slide. And uh, let's jump to the next slide. We want to talk a little bit about student engagement. I have a couple of these that I use in this course and some of my other courses, an icebreaker at the beginning of the term, um, which is a, a little autobiography of the students. It's written in the 100% online intro, introductory geology course, and it's done orally in all my other courses. This is just a way of the students um, telling about themselves to their cohort and also a conversation between the instructor and the students. Next slide. And then the, finally, I'll mention that I, uh, I have one activity action-oriented assignment in my online introductory geology course called uh, GL Selfie. This is where I assign students uh, geological features that they're expected to go find and photograph and take a picture of themselves uh, in front of that feature. Next slide. And the geo selfie, one of the topics they can choose of the three is a stream meander and a point bar. These are accessible in the Charlotte area. We have many uh, greenways and trails and they all follow streams. And so these are very easy for the students to find. Um, Sorry, we're going to have to move on now just because okay. it's been like 10 minutes. Okay, on to the next Well, thank you, Andy. Uh, there's a lot of things uh, that I would also support in what Andy said. For example, a uh, consistency of navigation of the materials. That is critical. So students know how to find materials quickly. The importance of a syllabus in an online class is equally important. And finally, clearly uh, providing your expectations to students. Uh, I've been teaching online now for 25 years. I started back in the mid 90s uh, first as a hybrid course and then offered the first fully online course in the California State University system in 1998. I teach classes in oceanography, earthquake hazards, geophysics, and tectonics. Uh, the oceanography class is for juniors and seniors, but it's general education. The same thing's true of earthquake hazards and physics and tectonics is for majors. Uh, I've been on a number of committees over the last several decades. Let's move on to the next slide. The first thing you want to do is be strategic. In other words, consider the class. Is it graduate level where doing research, that thematic presentation might be most important? An undergraduate major, which is data rich because it could be a prerequisite. And finally, general education, where you're really, at least I am anyway, focusing on the philosophy of science and how do we undertake science. And so focus on your learning goals and desired outcomes. You are all in crisis mode right now. What do you want students to get out of the class when the semester's over? And that's what you want to focus on. And how do you want to go do that? So keep your focus. You don't have to present everything. Next, decide whether to go synchronous or asynchronous. My experience over decades, go asynchronous. It's easiest and best for everybody. So students can access the material at, your, at their convenience, not, as your, not at yours. Stay modest. Keep it simple. And then build over time. You don't have time. That's why less is more is best. It's better to do one good online presentation per week than two rushed bad presentations. And by that, supplement your good one with other materials that are already available. Like Andy said, readings out of textbooks or reading assignments that you get off the New York Times or Washington Post or whatever newspaper. So don't try to do it all. Do what you do best and that's it. And let everybody, let other people or use resources from other places to do your second meeting a week. Next uh, slide, please. Here are nine thoughts from a recent article. 
Uh, start with the basics. Communicate your students time and time again. Let them know how you communicate with them. Work with an expert on your campus already or a mentor. For example, in your a faculty development center. It does not have to be perfect. Don't go for perfection. Just get it on right now. Fix the mistakes later, but have it be consistent. It's not online learning right now. It is emergency learning for a number of you. Work out the high quality, the high pedagogy for the fall. We'll talk about that maybe in a little bit. Uh, it's okay. You will make mistakes. <laughs> You're going to make mistakes. We all have. Uh, we learn to lessen those or create, make sure that mistake has a smaller impact. Uh, this is temporary, but there will be long-term repercussions, I believe. And look for silver linings. It allows you to think about how your students are learning far more than in a normal classroom. Next slide. Uh, the mechanics. I use a lot of YouTube videos. YouTube videos that I produce, YouTube videos that other, produ other people produce. I mean, IRIS, UNAVCO, the USGS, NASA, NOAA, CERT. There are so many phenomenal resources out there at all different levels. Search for those, find them, incorporate them, edit them. So your job is to set the context, not present all the material. As Andy said, inform your students of the expectations. Let them know what you expect of them. Be consistent in your format of the presentation and your due dates each week. You have to put stakes in the sand. I do twice a week. Everything that was assigned on Monday through Wednesday has to be done by Thursday night. Anything that was assigned on Thursday, Friday has to be done by Sunday night. Compartmentalize any videos, any presentation into 10 to 15 minute blocks. You lose focus after 15 minutes. Your students will too. I direct students through the work uh, with a worksheet that has embedded links and images in it. I'll show one of those in a little bit. Uh, present the due dates in only one place and already always refer to just that one place. So you can present or remind them many place of the due dates and I certainly encourage that as Andy said. But because you may have to do something on the fly, change your schedule. You always only want to have to change that one place. And then you always tell students to look at that one place at, uh, for due dates on any changes in assignment. I personally, and you may not have time to do this, I try to present the material as a research experience. I take students on virtual expeditions, underneath the oceans, along earthquake faults, and a whole variety of other things. Do not overload yourself with extensive grading and interaction. You get enough of that already, <laughs> no matter what you do. The interaction with students online via grading and feedback is far more extensive than in a classroom. You make far more comments on a paper or in a discussion section. So consider the grading and assessment portion, not only in terms of quality, and we can talk about that more later, but also how much you are going to have to do. You will be swamped. Next slide. Okay, about one more minute, please, Don. Okay. Here is my home page in Canvas. I have a, an update video on it every Tuesday morning it goes on. It allows students to, to I provide to them what they're doing this week and why. Next slide. Here are all the different virtual experiences I've created and I will make these available to you if you wish. I have a number of them in the CERC website already. Uh, this week and next I'll even put more where they do a variety of different types of virtual research experiments. Next slide. So this is what I mean by the worksheets that I embed graphics in them. I embed the links to the YouTube videos. So they download a worksheet that's someplace between eight to 12 pages. It directs them through the material because your students, like mine, take horrible notes. They are generally poorly organized. This allows them to take a well-organized set of notes based on the prompts I give them for what's important. So the questions that I pose to them in the worksheets, show them what's important. It also gives them access to all the videos. So in case your LMS gets overloaded, they're all on YouTube. They're all 10 to 15 minutes long maximum, some only five. It takes them through how to use virtual, they're definitely different types of online tools. Next slide. 
Here are more examples in that same, uh, where it takes them through this, in this case, uh, getting to know about seismic moment, earthquake magnitudes, location. And then I end the worksheet with instructions for a learning group discussion. That allows you to know if students are completing it. A very brief learning group discussion posting in Canvas that they must do. Break your class into groups of about six to eight students maximum and allow them to discuss the material through their postings, but focus their effort. I have them in many cases post two multiple choice questions based on the material and they have to then answer the multiple choice questions of another student and give two or three sentences of feedback on scientific insight and uh, communication quality. And I think this is my last slide. Thank you, Don. And then we'll move on to Adrian. Hi. Um, I started teaching lecture and lab online in about 2002. And I know a few questions that came in last night talked about teaching lab online. Um, one of the things we do try to do is keep our labs on as similar as possible as our lecture. So we actually send home lab kits, which is too late in the semester for people to manage that. But that's something I'd be more than willing to discuss how we do it if anybody ever has any questions. Um, once again, I would say on the organization part, I have to go with what everybody's already said. Consistency organization is going to keep students more successful. Um, one other thing that I would add that's even more important in an online class is beside each of your assignments, if you actually put in parentheses how long you would expect for it to take for the student, that gives the student an idea. So when the student tells you, I didn't get all my work done, and you're able to talk to me and say, well, how much time did you allot for each of those things? And if you put beside a lab, this was gonna take two and a half hours and they allotted 45 minutes, they've got you know a, a good reason why they didn't get their materials done in time. Um, John. Um, if you have not used backwards design in your classroom while you're recreating some of this and moving online, it's the perfect time to do it. Um, take those learning objectives that, that they've been talking about. What we did as a group is we made student learning objectives for every lesson that we have. And we blooms them, used all our blooms verbs. And I teach my students about blooms the very first day of class online and I explain to them, when you're going through these little note-taking templates I do with the learning objectives, it may say define these terms, but then it's going to go higher in others where I might ask you to be able to compare, explain, describe, draw. And so when the students are moving through their note-taking template with learning objectives, they know exactly what is expected of them and are able to fill it in. Um, on the next slide, I have an example of just one of one learning objective and metamorphism. So like my student learning objective six, um, explaining different processes of metamorphism. And I give the students the entire thing and I call it a note taking template. And when they're going through and doing their reading, they're supposed to go through here and describe what are the causes of metamorphism, write down scenarios and draw pictures where you would find each type of these. And so for every SLO, I have this, and the students are supposed to go in during their reading and um, actually fill these in, and they can use them as study guides or note-taking templates. And so once you've filled out using the backwards design what you want the students to learn, you can start looking at assessments, which was the main thing that I was gonna talk about. Um, flip to the next slide. Um, it's really important to have formative assessments in online because you're not there to just have them be able to raise their hands and tell you, um, you know, whether they got it right or wrong and for you to get a feel. I actually use soft chalks, which is shown in the bottom of this slide. And a soft chalk actually allows you to put in text, videos, um, links to other things, lectures, anything you want on multiple pages in one soft chalk. And then you can embed questions. So as the student reads, they can answer the question, check their answer right then, and see whether they got it right or wrong. Um, so these, I allow the students to do these as many times as they want to. And I will say, you're gonna have to make it count for a little something. It can be low stakes, but they're not gonna do it if you don't make it count for something. So make it very low stakes, but I allow, I keep these open the entire semester and tell students, oh, if you want a better grade, go back, do it again. And then they do them again when it comes time to study for midterms and finals and those kind of things. So formative assessments are important. Um, and then I'll try to talk real quick, so I'll make it my five minutes. If you'll flip to the next slide. 
Um, when you're looking at the summative assessments, you're going to have to think about what class you're teaching and the levels of your sort of SLOs. If you're doing um, time test, mainly multiple choice, short answer essay, you're going to have to make them timed because and then the other thing you're going to have to think about is if you tell students don't use your books, the only students that are going to use those books are the ones that aren't being honest. So just go ahead and let them all use their books. And then write questions in a manner that students have to think about it. Even if they're multiple choice, you can write good questions that make the students have to think and they can't Google the answers. Um, so if you do a mixture, multiple choice, I've even had them draw pictures and take a picture of it on their phone and send it to me while they're taking the test. Um, if they're timed, if you randomize questions, if you have, there's a lot of things you can do for you to be able to figure out the students actually taking the test and doing the work that needs to be done. Um, if you're doing larger scale assessments, like larger projects, but maybe things that students um, in a higher um, I would definitely say have them turn in segments along the way, because if you wait and it's all due at one time, it's going to just cause problems for everybody. Um, teaching online is going to be very different also to make sure that your rubrics are very clear. You can think you have the clearest rubric in the world, but when the student gets it, you're gonna have that one student who says, well, I read it like this. And you're like, oh, yeah, I see where you read it like that. Never thought you would, but I see it. So be very clear with your rubrics. It's gonna help you with your grading and it's gonna make it easier for the students to be able to put their work together. And be flexible. You may have to change things as you're going and you're probably gonna have to change wording and text as you move through. All right. Hi everyone, I'm Lindsay. Um, I've been teaching online courses for about the last 10 years, either online or a hybrid course. Um, I teach two to three of these a semester. Um, I, I'm gonna kind of reiterate a lot of what sort of Don and Andy and Adrian all said about sort of class management and communicating with your students to kind of keep them on task. So next slide, please. So that's what I call, these are my sort of key points for keeping everyone on task. The first one, be consistent. Next is be clear with your directions. And the last one is to really be patient and flexible with them, particularly now, particularly if this is the first time you've taught an online course, the first time your students are taking an online course, you will run into hiccups. Next. So consistency with your due dates. This is a screenshot from my syllabus, my updated syllabus for a course that used to be um, a hybrid class and has now gone to a fully online class. So similar to what Andy said at the beginning, right from the start of the semester, my students know when the work is going to be posted for them to start, when that due date is going to be, and then I've also given them a grid so they know exactly what is going to happen in that week. So they know that there's a lecture they need to read, there's always a quiz that goes along with that lecture, and then they'll know if they have another online activity that goes along with that as well. I've also got a module assessment um, column on there so they know when those major um, assessments are coming up that go along with sort of a, a unit of material. For myself, I like to do one week of work. Um, I know, you know, Don talked about having two different due dates throughout the week. For myself, I find that having just one due date works best. I think as long as you are consistent with which day of the week you choose or days and what time of day, that's kind of the key thing so that both you and your students can get into a routine and make sure that they're kind of keeping up with everything. I find Wednesday to work really well for me, partly because I like a midweek due date so that if students have those last minute questions, which they always do because students always leave work till the last minute, um, then they can at least get a hold of me. I find that on the weekend, that's a lot harder because I'm not as easy to get a hold of on the weekend. But a midweek works well. I have office hours and a lot of time that day to meet with students. So that's why I've chosen Wednesday. Um, but you do what works best for you. Next slide, please. Um, my next point is to be clear with directions. So this, the top there is a screenshot from D2L, which is our course management system that we use. Um, you can see that on there, I've got the units of work labeled with the same, you know, unit names that I give in my schedule so that that's all consistent for students. With each set of material I post, I like to give them a checklist. This has been sort of this you know, key kind of revelation I came to early on with online teaching 
that I found is super helpful both to keep me on task, but also make sure they know exactly what they need to do each week. It's in the syllabus already, but this is like an extra check. I think it's no problem to have these directions in multiple places to just make sure they see it. Um, so in the checklist, I always have, you know, read the lecture, do the quiz, right? I always say where they also need and how they're going to submit that work to me. So quiz for the lecture, for this particular one, they're, they also have an assignment. For this one, I want them to put that assignment into the assignment folder in D2L. Sometimes I have them put that assignment they completed as a quiz, just kind of depends on the week and what the work is. On this checklist, I'll also put any other little notes I want to give them for the week, um, as well as always a reminder, I always stick a reminder on there to ask questions. So either directly to me in an email if they want, or I always have just sort of a general discussion board open where they can use it as sort of an informal chat room with other students. So they can post questions there, other students can see and answer them. Um, this checklist also includes just kind of a little note on the bottom there telling them to stay positive. Uh, just, you know, in this time and what's going on with the world right now, I wanted to give them a couple extra notes on making sure everybody's spirits stay up. Next slide, please. So this is from one of the assignments I post. And again, at the top of the assignment, just to be clear with directions, I always have a little box there that tells them yet again how to submit that to me. Um, whether it's through the assignment folder in D2L, which is what this particular assignment directions show, I like to have them fill in right in this Word document what their answers are. I tell them to use blue or green text just so it's a whole lot easier for me to see their answers when I go to grade it, easier to pick it out from all the black text of what I've written for them. Um, the assignments themselves will have far more detailed directions in them than what I would give if this was being handed out in a face-to-face -face class, right? Because I'm not there to, you know, pull up websites on the screen and help students navigate it in the classroom. And so I like to pull screenshots and annotate them um, to stick right into the directions so that students can more easily figure out exactly where they need to go and what they need to do for each assignment. Next slide, please. Um, this is an example of the directions I would give if they were going to complete this through a quiz in D2L instead of that assignment folder. So again, just stick that direction box right at the top just so it's nice and clear for them. This particular assignment is adapted from Integrate, which I can't say enough good things about the Integrate materials, about all the materials you can find on CERC. A lot of them within the materials themselves already have some tips for how to adjust their, the assignments to become online assignments. Um, otherwise, the assignments themselves are already really great and you can probably figure out how to adjust that to work for your class. So I highly recommend those. And I know John's gonna talk about that more later. Next slide. All right, my last point, be patient and be flexible. Um, there's gonna be times where you are gonna forget to post material for your class or you know, the last day that material's open, a student emails you and says, oh, by the way, this link that was in your assignment doesn't work anymore. Why nobody told you earlier in the week? Who knows, but that happens a lot, right? Links go down all the time. Um, you know, you just kind of have to roll with it. Change due dates if you need to, that's okay. Um, it's gonna happen. You are gonna have students who don't get the work done on time, just like they wouldn't in a face-to-face -face class, you know, even though they can see those due dates on the schedule you gave them. The D2L system itself provides due dates. There's a calendar in that system. Um, so they can see those due dates in multiple places and they still won't get it done. Just be upfront with them about what your guidelines are for, for how you deal with those sorts of issues and make sure you've communicated those with your students. Um, you're of course gonna have students that just, you know, only ever complete the work at the last minute. That's gonna happen. Some portion of your students are gonna do that. It happens in face-to-face -face classes too. All you can do is make sure they know when everything's due. Um, I think the most important thing in the end is really just keep communicating with them. You choose what's best for you and kind of stick to that format. So if it's course announcements, if it's emails with them, you know, whatever you find to be the best form for you, 
keep doing it. You're going to find that the written communication you have with your online class is going to end up being more than with a typical face-to-face -face course, both proactively on your part, getting those messages out that you would usually just say, but also students asking questions. There will be a lot more email interaction um, with you and your students than, than you're probably used to from a face-to-face -face course. Okay, thank you so much, Lindsay. We're going to move on to Gretchen now, our last panelist. Okay, so first, ditto to everything <laughs> that's been said so far. Um, I mainly teach introductory geology online, um, but I have several times taught environmental geology online, and this semester I am suddenly teaching it online again, but at least I've got some resources from a previous semester to use. Um, the one thing that I'm always focused on when I'm working on online materials is making sure that my online and seated students are getting similar learning experiences. Um, I want the students to come out of the course with um, having learned the same material, even though it's being presented a little differently. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I'm going to reiterate the communication thing. Super important. Students, it's, it's really easy for them to feel isolated in an online course. And so communication is important to help them feel part of the class. Um, of course, it's good for you as an, as an instructor to be communicating regularly with your students, but I've also found that students um, also need to communicate with each other um, in order to really feel part of the course. Um, this is especially true if your course was seated earlier this semester and is now online because the students already know each other. And so giving them a chance to continue those connections, I think, is really important. Um, of course, there's a lot of tools out there to help students communicate with each other. The one that I really like is um, the discussion board. Next slide, please. So I actually have a required discussion board in my online class. Every single week, the students have to participate as part of their grade and part of their attendance requirement for the week. Um, and basically, it's like a, a giant group work. Um, they're for most of my assignments, as long as it's not a test, they're allowed to share their answers. Um, and so they can post a question, you know, I got this answer for question whatever, um, but it was marked wrong. Can anybody tell me where to find the right answer? That sort of thing. Um, when the students embrace it, they really do learn the material better because they're helping to teach each other the material. Um, they're also really good at finding other resources and videos and things that I don't know about, and they post those as well. Like, I've, you know, I figured out the answer was a conversion plate boundary because of this cool video, and they post the link to it. Um, right here is one example of a student who posted several questions, um, and, and this is a good example because she, she put the question um, and what she said her answer was, but that it was marked wrong, and so she asked for some help. And then in the reply beneath that, we see a student who um, helps to answer a couple of those questions. Um, and so there's a sort of a back and forth between them as, as they all sort of work through this together. Um, and I, I really enjoy um, this particular assignment and the students most of the time get, get a lot out of it. Um, next slide, please. The other thing I'll talk about a little bit is assessment. Um, I'm gonna go back to what Adrian was saying about backwards design and Bloom's Taxonomy. Um, if you're not familiar with Bloom's Taxonomy, it is a super helpful tool um, to help you set your expectations for learning. Um, this is one example of Bloom's Taxonomy. The bottom is um, the most basic type of learning. It's just memorizing. As you move up the pyramid, you get to um, more and more creative types of um, learning. And if we go to the next slide, uh, there's um, a set of verbs at the bottom of the slide there um, that correlate with the different levels of learning in Bloom's Taxonomy. This is just an example. There are other verbs that work as well. Um, but if you are careful about picking verbs at the level that you want the students to know something, and then you use those verbs as you're teaching that something, then the students know what's expected when it comes assessment time. Um, so it's a great tool for setting those learning objectives and for helping you with your assessments and whatnot. Um, 
and setting expectations for your students, you know, sharing this knowledge with them so they know what to expect. But then additionally, if you're worried about making sure that the rigor of your CDA course matches your online course, Bloom's Taxonomy is a great tool to help align that as well. Um, so making sure you're, you're carrying through similar expectations between your different courses. Um, and I'll go ahead and wrap up there. Thanks. So now John is going to talk. Yep, great. So for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, I know a number of people who uh, signed up for the Red Group webinar are not all that familiar with NAGT um, and probably therefore not familiar that much with Teach the Earth. Um, Teach the Earth is uh, the portal for all the teaching materials, activities, resources that have been sponsored uh, in some way by NAGT. Um, there are thousands of teaching activities, many of which have been peer reviewed through a, a process that NAGT runs. Um, and there's also lots of um, robust uh, advice and guidance on using various active learning pedagogies and techniques in the geoscience classroom. Um, so specifically, uh, to respond to this crisis that we're all finding ourselves in. We went through the collections and developed a new section for Teach the Earth to pull together the resources that we already have um, and uh, make them more available. Um, so first, I wanted to draw your attention to, uh, on this page, we've got a, uh, a collection uh, that's constantly growing of community events that are happening virtually. Anytime we hear about a webinar or a virtual workshop or something that we want, that we think the community wants to know about, we are uh, pulling that together and putting it uh, out there via this page in this um, aggregated list. Um, we're also, we or have organized uh, an, an email discussion list for anybody who's um, either has experience or has questions or has resources, any, anyone who wants to discuss the issues with other people who um, are sort of in the same boat, um, you can click here on this, uh, on this uh, button and uh, get access to that list. And we have a, the archives where everything gets saved so you can go back and see what things people have already posted as well as uh, join in on any uh, conversations going forward. So, and we also, like you've just heard, we have a lot of people in the geoscience community who have vast experience teaching online. Um, and so uh, Don mentioned that he has a number of things on the CERC website. I know all of them have, have uh, used CERC resources and have uh, had that expertise. And so we wanted to be, enable the community to share back with each other. Um, so we have ways of sharing teaching activities, course descriptions, if you know of or are putting on a virtual event that you think the community would be interested in hearing about, you can um, share those uh, experiences via the website as well. Um, and finally, I think probably the thing that everybody's looking for right now is teaching activities and guidance and advice. Um, so we've got uh, a number of things here and I was going to I was going to switch over to the website, but I think we want to make sure that we leave enough time for um, questions uh, from the community. So I'm just going to uh, ask Carol to post some links into the chat uh, box. And so one of them, this quick transition to online teaching is uh, going through uh, resources that we've had for a number of years. We've run a number of workshops on teaching online um, and pulling out the pieces that we think are most time critical and, and sensitive to what's happening right now to give you a sense of how do I move forward uh, just in the next very short piece of time. Uh, the next thing is, uh, is some best practices for teaching about the earth online. Uh, the Integrate Project, which uh, Lindsay mentioned earlier, had a workshop in 2015 that brought together uh, 30 or so uh, faculty who teach geoscience online. Adrienne was there and she was one of the, uh, one of the conveners of the workshop. And it brought them together to actually talk about their, their common, common lessons learned, common challenges, things that one person may have seen, found that another didn't. Um, and they developed this set of web pages that lay out some best practices around different aspects of um, making a difference in students learning uh, in the online settings. So I think that is a really important uh, piece. And lastly, uh, I'll point out that we have an activity collection on the Teach the Earth website in this area, specifically targeting the things that um, are immediately useful 
for teaching online. Um, as I mentioned, the, the Teach the Earth collection is thousands and thousands of activities, and we're at the moment uh, engaged in an effort to go through and make sure that all the things that are useful in teaching online are actually tagged as useful for teaching online. There are currently about 150 things in that, in that collection uh, right now, but it's already doubled in size over the last week as we add more things to it and as the community contributes new teaching activities through those forms that I mentioned above. Um, lastly, uh, and this is not on this page yet, but uh, there's a group uh, that's been spearheaded by uh, Chris Atchison of the International Association for Geoscience Diversity, uh, looking at how do we do really good remote field work um, and that there's a working group that's organizing around that and uh, 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 there's a lot of sort of hot off the press information that they're trying to put together. How do we actually do robust um, field work with students when we have to do it online? Uh, so there's there's lots of stuff coming out there and that will be being added to this page very soon. Um, so I think that uh, with the with the. With that in mind, I think we should maybe go on to the questions and see if there are things that uh, we haven't covered that people are interested in knowing about. Yeah, so um, we have questions that have already been sent to John. Um, and so I'll start with those to the panel. And I, what I think I'll say to the panel is let's, let's try to be efficient in our answers so that we can get through more of the different questions. And then we invite people to keep asking more questions in the chat box, maybe, in, because there's like a 260 of y'all um, start with people in the last names A to L so they don't come in so fast that we can't read them and then we'll you know jump to the second half of the alphabet in a sec uh, but to start with um, uh, and, and the, the questions that came in beforehand I did try to sort of pull together into one question if there were multiple ones but maybe um, pros and cons of synchronous versus asynchronous uh, from the panel um, and maybe I'll just say Don, and then after that, anyone else jump in if they have other things to say. Yeah, I've always, uh, students have always wanted to do uh, asynchronous, to learn at their time, especially when their schedules are disrupted as they are now. I have held uh, synchronous uh, study sessions, and it tends to be a much smaller subset of the total students in the class. Uh, so that that's always been my experience. It's just the students wanted asynchronous. Anyone else on the panel? Yeah, I would I would back that up. The uh, I have a colleague who uh, learned in about a week. He he wanted to just directly transfer his face to face lecture into online, and it didn't work at all. So he went to asynchronous. I agree. I I like an asynchronous format too, but I think if you're coming from a class that was fully face-to-face -face before and you're wanting to do, you know, Zoom meetings with your class, just to have that kind of consistency for them, great, but I don't think maybe it should be a required part of their class, you know, record that and, and post it for them in case they can't, you know, with everything that's going on in their lives in case they can't be there at that class time anymore. All right, thank you very much. There was a number of questions um, and some more during the chat box as well about people saying like, what do I do for labs like rocks and minerals? And can we do this with really good photographs? Um, or, uh, I, I mean, I know Adrian said that she sends out specimens, but given that we're halfway through the semester or more already, what are some thoughts on these sort of really hands-on labs that intro courses often have? I, I don't have much thought for what you could do now if students haven't already gotten through that, but say for fall, if this is still happening, what we do is have rock and mineral boxes. Um, you know, we've, we've purchased a set of them with department funds that we then check out, like we're the library for it, and we check out these boxes to students at the beginning of the semester. And I think part of what you have to think through when you're doing that is rethinking the types of questions you ask about the rocks. The boxes we have are already labeled, so the students know what every sample in it is already. So you can't, you know, just ask them to run through and figure out, you know, what the ID of this particular sample is, but instead have them think about different things with those samples. So for example, you know, instead 
instead of having them identify the quartz sandstone versus the Arcos, they already have that label. So instead, make them observe and talk about, you know, the similarities and differences between those two, and then ask some higher level questions about, you know, which one's undergone more weathering and how do they know that and have them sort of think through that process while still having that physical sample in front of them. I think the, uh, the issue with labs will be a very class by class specific matter. If you're a hand sample rich laboratory, yeah, then you have to do some creative thinking and distribution of resources. Instead, if it's a more data rich lab, like oceanography could be, seismology could be, tectonics can be, then I think you can actually replicate the lab very well online. So it just depends on the nature of uh, the data and the specimens that you use in the class. And, and I think I might add, like, look at those online resources that um, are being compiled on the teaching online, you know, uh, site that John just talked about and see if there's more ideas there for your particular um, lab. Um, and, and 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 move from there and then and and to then also follow up on what don said it maybe this is when you're like okay i'm not doing anything related to hand specimens i'm going to have my students looking at climate data you know and then just be like <laughs> so data it is this term um and because that is going to be easier probably to move on i mean with. like the unavco velocity viewer yes. and then the unavco <laughs> plate motion calculator yes. the usgs <laughs> earthquake websites uh, in fact, I would argue an online class, in many ways, at least the way I do it, I teach it more like a lab class in that I present data, students with data, they work through that data, they use various online tools to work with that data. Uh, depending on the subject matter, it can be very effectively done online. Thank you. Um, and so folks that are in the second half of the alphabet, go ahead and start typing yours too. I can see we're just going to have a hard time getting through all of the questions, but we'll do the best we can. Um, so some other questions um, that we've gotten a lot of questions about assessment and proctoring exams. And I think there were some comments going on um, also during the chat box, but how do people um, do high stakes exams um, when you can't oversee them directly? So we've had like only open it for an hour, only open it for 24 hours, but then they only get an hour to actually do it. What are some other thoughts from the committee on that type of thing, sort of summative assessment? Um, you can also randomize the questions um, depending on your management system. You may be able to set it to where they only see one question at a time. So if you students trying to work together, that would be harder for them um, to cheat. Um, and, and I think Adrian already said earlier, just making sure that the questions you write are not ones that you can really easily type into Google and get a really quick answer for. <laughs> And also yeah, I, having I, exams that pull from a, a larger test bank too. Yeah, that's what I was going to mention. Randomizing questions from a, a subsets from a larger test bank helps a lot with that. And there are um, resources like uh, the one that I know that the University of Minnesota uses is called Proctorio, which requires students to webcam their entire room to show that there's nobody there and then it's recording them the entire time that they're taking the exam. And so there are tools that have pluses and minuses um, that can be used technologically to, to address some of that. But that usually takes a, a, a relationship and a license and all that stuff that you may not have, but for future reference. What I do, as one of our contributors uh, mentioned, I actually back engineer my exams. I say, here are the things, here are the critical components I want students uh, to learn and therefore be assessed. Then, as was mentioned by a number of people, I create banks of questions, each one in each one of those categories, so that every student has a unique exam that it every question may have five potential questions or six that are picked at random whether it's multiple choice or whether it's essay style so nobody receives the same exam it's always different however they touch on the same subject matters 
It's just ask in a different way. Different types of data are brought in. The calculations doing forward or backwards. The answers are randomized. There are all kinds of ways that you can do that. And one thing I, I'm sure Andy can, can mention, because we've talked about this already, is that some of my exam questions are truly unique. It's more about process than about content. Uh, they write a research grant proposal. They discuss how, a very brief one, mind you, uh, they discuss how science is used to address this topic. So it's not just a straight, you know, chug out the answer kind of thing. It's, it, it requires a little bit more insight that they develop as they're taking the exam. They're learning from the exam, in other words. Thank you. Um, so another question that came in um, was if the panel could speak to the differences between a lower level class and an upper level class, and if you would do run it any differently. Well, I, I certainly am doing it differently this semester because my applied geophysics class, uh, except for quizzing and some assignments, was fully face-to-face. -face. And so I couldn't rebuild it from the ground up like I did for my intro geology class. Um, and, and so um, it's a whole different approach is, is what I'm finding. And Don has done multiple levels, and, and maybe he could comment on that as well. Yeah, I, I do treat them a little differently. As I mentioned, I customize uh, for the level. And what do I want students to have based on that level? Majors, they may be taking a class after mine that depends on the prerequisites. So I have to be data rich. I have to be concept rich. There's a lot of information. For lower level GE classes, you know, uh, my experience has been the students often forget the material by the time they take the next class above them. And so I don't feel uh, as compelled to cover all subjects underneath that particular discipline. My oceanography class, for example, I, I focus on four things. I focus on uh, marine resource uh, sustainability, uh, underwater earthquakes and geohazards, uh, the ocean and climate change, and the marine ecosystem. I don't cover tides. I don't cover a bunch of other stuff. So yeah, there is a difference the way you handle lower division versus uh, I think upper division courses. Thanks. Um, so I know we're pretty much out of time, but there's also been um, several questions. So this will be the last sort of questions, I would say, um, related to managing groups, sort of, let's say, uh, encouraging groups, uh, group learning, and also in uh, just getting students to be more engaged, I guess I would say. So maybe both with and without groups. But yeah, so student engagement, maybe in particular, in a, um, getting group work done in a remote way, but just in general too. Um, I would say with any type of group work, um, in the, especially in the online environment, you're going to have to force the issue with it being part of their grade or, or somehow a required thing. Um, if it is optional, they're not going to do it. Um, and because and that's how I used to have my discussion board and I'd get you know five questions a semester or something. In order to have a really um, an enriching group experience, it's got to be something that's required and has a consequence if they don't do it. Yeah, I've tried, I've tried uh, group work in face, large face-to-face -face intro geology classes and also in the online version. And to be honest, the students don't like it because they find how things work in the real world. If there are five people in their group, there's one or two people who are just not going to, not going to carry their load. And so they don't really appreciate that element of group work. Well, I really want to thank everyone for joining us. Oh, do you have Don? Okay, one more this thing. Is one critical tip I would like to give everybody based on experience. At the beginning, at the get go, tell students that if they have any questions on course content or assignments, post it in the a discussion area, your instructor office discussion area, or else you'll get 37 of the exact same questions from the different students and it'll be so repetitive. Force them, tell them time and time again, I asked you to post all questions on course content and 
assignments in the Don's office discussion area. It'll save you a huge amount of time. But they won't do it. One, one of my sons who finished college recently said, no, they won't do it because their name is going to be attached with a question that then they the think question, is dumb. Then the question was really not very important. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and the person to go find it. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Um, and thank you for all that you're managing through this crisis, you know, and continuing to teach um, your students to the best of your ability. There will be more webinars on other topics through the NIGT webinar series approximately weekly for the rest of the term, um, with earthquake locations being the one next week. We would really appreciate your feedback. Um, uh, and uh, the feedback survey link will go out to you as well. And, and um, do join the community of teaching online in the geosciences, and we'll just continue to support each other through this. Stay well.